Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Fulbright Association's webinar, Fulbright in the Classroom, the info, info session for spring 2021. We're so delighted that you could join us, and I look forward to this conversation. My name is John Bader. I'm the executive director of the Fulbright Association, and we're going to have a, an open discussion today about the Fulbright in the Classroom project. I want to thank all of you for attending and uh, for your interest in this very important program. This program is a personal mission of mine, as I hope it is of yours. When I returned from my Fulbright to India many years ago, I had no audience to share my experiences with other than my poor benighted family. So uh, it has taken a long time to find the opportunity as executive director to start a program like this, which we did in 2017. During this uh, webinar, we're going to do a, a couple of things just so you know what's going to happen. I'll give you an update on the program. We'll talk about challenges and your impact. We'll talk about audience. Uh, next, we'll look at your options for how you can participate in this program. We'll review resources available on our website. Then we're going to take a small pause to take your questions using the Q&A function on this Zoom call. So please go ahead as we go along and put your questions in Q&A. I'll come back with the slides and we'll review a few more things before we finish. First, steps to the process. How do you make this happen? How do you get in front of students? We'll also take a look at the new grant program and we'll review how to apply and how to uh, move forward with that program. And then finally, we'll open up the entire conversation to the full uh, attendees of this uh, call. And uh, we'll look at your faces and we'll have a conversation further about uh, Fulbright in the classroom. Okay, this, this program began in 2017, as I mentioned, it builds on a tradition that Fulbrighters have always had. Ever since 1946, 75 years ago, returning Fulbrighters have always shared their stories with their fellow citizens, with other folks. They've used their experience in many ways to teach others about the world. So we're building on that particular tradition with this program Fulbright in the Classroom. Uh, it's worth noting that if all of you on this call, as well as all of those who have expressed interest in this program, signed up to do just one of these, you would it have four times the impact that we have had in the last three years because the program has been so small. So this webinar and this relaunch uh, offers an exciting opportunity to take this program to a much higher level and to meet many more audiences. It's very exciting. What is new? First, of course, we're enjoying the 75th anniversary of the Fulbright program, and that challenges us to reflect on the impact of the program and to share its impact. We'll be offering these programs this spring all digitally. So that's a new feature of this program. In other words, you'll be connecting to classrooms through Zoom and other online services rather than doing it in person. We hope to resume that in the fall with the conditions pending. The second thing that's new is a, a grant program offering a financial incentive and reward for volunteers like you. We'll be discussing that more further. As part of our strategic plan uh, that the Fulbright Association is following, we are uh, exp expanding our reach and also sharpening it in a way to reach underrepresented students. The Fulbright program does not fully represent all Americans as it should. And we're hoping that Fulbright in the classroom can target those uh, students and those communities so that they learn more about Fulbright and gain from our experiences. And finally, what's new is the State Department right now is running their own classroom project in celebration of the 75th, and more information on that is found on the Fulbright in the Classroom website. 
Let me talk about challenges first. Volunteers on this program own this program. This is not something that the Fulbright Association itself administers in the sense that you need to find your own classrooms, your own faculty partners, and you develop your own presentation. So this is volunteer-driven logistics. The program does not uh, establish it for you, which requires a, a strong level of commitment and hard work on your part. I just want to be upfront about that. It's an exciting program, but it relies on you and your hard work. Our association's assistance, therefore, is limited to offering you digital tools, which you will find in the toolkit online. The impact, though, we think, by owning this, will be more tailored to the community and to the people you know, to institutions that you have connections to. And of course, you'll have the opportunity to build a presentation that fits your story. It belongs to you. Let's talk about audience. So when we started this program, our focus was on K to 12 students uh, in your area. That's when we were operating before COVID. Um, but with the opening of the digital uh, opportunities, we realized that there were great opportunities to reach other audiences. So we'd like you to think about really a lot of different kinds of classrooms. Those could be K to 12 schools in your area. You might focus on Title I schools. Um, you might, ex we've expanded this go to go beyond K to 12 to include community colleges and minority serving institutions. So in other words, we're trying to reach out to a wide range of students and, and, and the choice is yours as to who uh, to focus on. The presentation itself, when you're thinking about audience, is not about the research or the project that you did specifically on your Fulbright. What we'd like you to do is to introduce them and, and lead a conversation about the country that you visited. So the Research creates a context for this, but the country itself is the, is the subject of the presentation, focusing on the personal, the cultural, and the geographic of that experience. And as I said, therefore, your uh, Fulbright experience was an excuse to learn and to travel, to serve as a citizen diplomat, and now you're coming home to share those experiences with others, to let them know what the world is like. This is also not a recruitment program for the Fulbright program itself. We leave that to uh, the program and to uh, the vendors associated with the various programs. Our job is to raise the profile of the Fulbright program and let the world know that it's there, it's a resource, and this is the impact and power that it has had. There are several options for uh, participating in Fulbright in the classroom. You can be a volunteer. We've been doing this for a number of years where uh, Fulbrighters, that is uh, folks who have returned uh, from overseas and are Americans living here or visiting Fulbrighters right at this moment, they choose to go wherever they like and give a presentation in any format they would like to do. So for example, we had students who had come from Indonesia, they were attending a university in Iowa, they arranged for, thanks to the chapter in Iowa, they, they arranged for a, a set of presentations at a middle school in rural Iowa, which was very exciting. These students had never seen somebody from outside uh, of the United States, let alone folks from Indonesia. So you can volunteer and you could do that now using the tools that we have online, you could arrange for a digital meeting anytime this spring, perhaps in the fall, and do it on your own, and you're good to go. The second option is to apply for the $750 grant. Again, we'll get into this more detail in a moment. This is a more formal approach to this, where you would propose to give three presentations to classrooms that serve underrepresented students. So there's, you'd, you'd have to offer a proposal and you'd have to have a plan and it's more formalized, but in exchange for that, there would be a grant. For this, you would apply by May 1st 
You'd be notified by June 1st, and you'd present in the fall. Now, of course, we'd encourage you to do both of these things. You can both volunteer and apply for a grant. If the grant comes through, great. If it doesn't, you could do both. In either case, you need to be a member of the Fulbright Association to apply and to participate. If that proves to be a barrier to you, then please contact us. Okay, let's talk about resources before I take a pause for questions. And I look forward to answering your questions during this pause. So feel free to go into the Q&A feature and uh, write them down. You'll see on our website a variety of uh, resources to make this go for you. You see the website there, fulbright.org slash Fulbright in the Classroom. On the FIC homepage, you'll see an introduction, you'll learn about the process, and this is where we'll post this recording of this video. As we get further into this website, you'll see their FAQs. This covers a wide variety of questions posed by alumni as they've uh, experienced this uh, program to learn about content, where you put photos, how does it all work, uh, who is eligible to do this, and so on. Lots of good questions are answered there. The toolkit is really an important place to go. There are templates for outreach. If you're writing to a faculty member, you can find a template there to explain the program. You'll find the logo for Fulbright in the Classroom, which is in the upper hand, upper right hand corner of this uh, presentation. There'll be plans and forms that you can fill out. So for example, the reflection form, which is very important once you've done this uh, program, is found there so that you can tell us what happened and what you learned. And finally, there is a website for the Fulbright in the Classroom grant. You'll see the mission, you'll learn about the application process, and you'll see the forms to complete in order to apply for the program. And finally, we're available to you to answer your questions by emailing classroom at fulbright.org. Uh, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen for just a minute so I can, so you can see me. And to take a look at questions. Okay. Could a first question comes from Carla. Could a former visiting Fulbrighter participate? I'm from Spain and I was visiting Fulbrighter in Washington from 2018 to 2020. And Carla, the answer is yes, absolutely. We'd welcome your presentation. Of course, what you'd be talking about is Spain, right? Because these students would want to learn more about who you are and the country that you're from. Another question from Stephanie. Is it possible to team up with other Fulbrighters who have had, this, had the same host country and develop a lesson plan together? Yes, absolutely. I was telling you the story of a group of students who had all come from Indonesia, and they basically did a tag team where they were all sharing their experience, of course, their experiences and knowledge of their own country. So if you have friends who uh, had a similar experience, certainly work together with them and we can make it happen. Uh, Maria asked this question, is it okay if the three targeted underrepresented universities are in the same city and are all HBCUs? Yes, is the answer to that question as well. So we are looking for uh, creating meaningful relationships and meaningful contacts, if they all happen to be in the same city or even within the same institution, that's just fine. We're try this is a new program. We want to be flexible here and we want to go to what you have the contacts to do. So yes, Maria, that would be just fine. Um, let's see, we got a question from Grace. I'm currently working for an American Indian higher education, I would like to present to high schools serving American Indians and Alaska Natives, but they are located in the reservations, which will require me to travel. Can this presentation be done virtually? Yes. So we're encouraging all of you to do, at least for now, these presentations virtually. Of course, that gives you a lot of freedom to go where you like and to reach out to communities that may be remote or difficult. In the future, we're hoping post-COVID, God willing, 
that folks are able to travel to locations. Our grant program, we hope to grow, we hope to get more resources for that, win another foundation grant so that we can fund travel to places like Indian reservations. Okay, a question from Gloria. As a Fulbrighter from an underrepresented group, I'm particularly interested. Will we receive a recording of this presentation? Yes, Gloria, will. we're recording it right now and we'll post it on the Fulbright in the Classroom uh, webpage as soon as it's processed. Okay, another question. Wow, these are all great questions. For the FIC grant proposal, is there a grade level preference for these presentations? For example, some of the public elementary schools in my city are 95% plus BIPOC students. Uh, no, there is no grade preference for these presentations. You can fit whatever works for you. If uh, going to an elementary school fits your comfort level, your experience, perhaps you have a child in a, in a local elementary school or contacts with local faculty, or you simply want to work locally, that's great. Whatever works for you works for us. Tiffany asks, asks this question. Can you expand on how you would identify underrepresented schools? Now, this is, this is a more difficult question, Tiffany. We're trying to identify uh, schools on an ongoing basis. This program as focused with underrepresented communities is just getting started. We're building uh, partnerships, for example, with a series of HBCUs around the country, but I would welcome uh, your suggestion on how best to find an underrepresented school. Uh, Thomas asked this question. I did a Fulbright to Jamaica in 1988. Would that be too long ago to participate in FIC? Um, I've kept connections with Jamaica's realities and with friends and colleagues here. Thomas, that's just fine. If you feel comfortable enough that you can share your experience um, of some time ago, that's just fine. The further it gets in, into the background, and the less comfortable you are, the more likely that's probably not a good idea, but it sounds like you're um, perfectly uh, well suited for this. I'll do a couple more and then we'll go back to our presentation, but these are great questions and I appreciate it. Um, does the type of school matter um, is another question, public versus private versus charter schools. I think the important here, thing here is to change minds and to expose people who have not had that opportunity. That's certainly true that some public schools and some private schools have already very, uh, um, uh, very cosmopolitan audiences. They are already in a very diverse area. They've already got exposure to many international stories. That's something you'll have to judge yourself. There's no particular rule on this, just that you want to have the greatest impact that you have can have. We'll do uh, three more. Is it possible to deliver presentations at my own institution, which is an HBCU, asked Paula. Yes. In fact, we've had some really terrific success with people who are already faculty uh, in a school or a university. For example, one uh, faculty member on a school, a middle school in Indiana, gave a series of presentations to a total of 600 students. She was able to do that because she already had relationships with other faculty members and obviously was in the same school. She had never talked about her Fulbright experience before, but she got an incredible audience and over 200 students wrote her thank you notes uh, about the program. Uh, Rhonda asks, I was thinking of giving presentations at universities to share e the ETA program. I'm thinking of rural universities in Wisconsin. Does that seem to qualify? Absolutely. Um, again, we're defining this pretty broadly right now, but rural areas uh, are certainly on our list of targeted um, co uh, communities. Uh, Linda asks, for all of us wishing to collaborate, particularly in the digital aspects, is there, where that the, is there a way that the FA staff could put folks of a like country together? Well, Linda, we're, we could try to do that. Right now, we have about 100 people who are interested in the program. And as you communicate with us and you can tell us what you're interested in, when we may be able to make uh, connections. Again, 
This program is in development. We're still working on these things as we get more experience and more help from your community, from our community like you, the more we can do. Uh, and then let's see, I will do two more. Uh, um, Grace asks, what is the purpose of the funding? Is it an honorarium or a funds to be used to buy things? It really is an honorarium, Grace, uh, although you, because we think that these digital uh, presentations will involve few or no expenses uh, in that particular way, but there's no restriction on, on how it would be spent. And finally, a question from Suzanne, how many of the FIC grants are available uh, to participants? There will be 23 grants uh, available in this particular uh, program. And I'll get more uh, to that in just a minute. Okay. Wow. Fantastic. Love all the questions. We'll keep going. Let me get back to uh, our presentation. Okay. So the uh, question is, um, uh, how do you get started? How do you do this process? How do you make it all work? Okay, so step one is to connect the faculty. This quite frankly is the most challenging of the four steps. Where do I go? Many of the questions that you posed have to do with just that. Our argument is that it's a good idea to stay to pick a particular kind of student that you would like to reach out to. And by that, I mean age. So if you're interested in middle schoolers or community college students, um, think about who you think would best be suited for the kind of presentation you would like to give, and then focus on that. The next step would be to research the contacts within those institutions. So a local school, a local community college, an HBCU, uh, in Texas that you want that you have a relationship with. Take a, a look at their websites to find the relevant faculty. We found a lot of success with language uh, teachers and professors, as well as those in the social sciences. In an elementary and middle school, there's a lot of flexibility there, but we have generally found that working directly with faculty rather than working through the administration, principal, a dean, et cetera, uh, tends to be a more effective way to do this, less time consuming, and you find the right people to partner with. You can contact those folks using the template found on our toolkit. As you make uh, this contact, you'll find, of course, you'll need to partner with faculty on why you're doing it. What is it that you want to share? What, of course, is the timing that would suit his or her uh, students best? And how do you get access, meaning through Zoom in the future, that would mean getting uh, in-person access. And as I've mentioned several times, this will be digital presentations for now, and we hope uh, in-person as things move along. Step two, prepare your presentation. Remember your audience, of course, right? You want to tailor that particular uh, presentation to the audience that you're addressing. Uh, obviously, a conversation with a uh, sixth grade class will be significantly different than with a community college class. Um, so think about what your audience is. Focus on the personal, the cultural, travel, the impact. You want to be talking about the, the country itself, not so much about yourself. So um, a, lot of, a lot of presenters think that they need to talk about their entire Fulbright journey from application to the challenges they faced and others. Those are good stories to tell, but they're not particularly effective in it for an audience like this. You really want to be talking about the country that you visited or that you're from. And think about what is unique, what is different about that country, and also what's familiar. So as you're talking to students, you're talking about what kinds of music people like or what kinds of uh, holidays they celebrate and compare those to the ones that are familiar to American students. As you think about your presentation, you want to gather photos, notes, and stories from your, obviously, from your own experience so that you can share those. When we're in person, that might be tangible things that you collected or gathered or purchased when you were overseas. For now, it would be something that could be digitized and shared that way. And then finally, think, what am I sharing that 
I that could not be found online. So if you were to Google India, which is where I went on my Fulbright, there are obviously so many resources there. What is it about your experience in a place like India that was uniquely yours and, and special and worth sharing? Step three, tell your story. This is the presentation itself. So now you're online, you're connected by Zoom, you've got your time. You'll want to think about how to run that presentation. Of course, introduce yourself. Who are you? What are you doing? What are you doing there? Talk about the Fulbright program, but really keep to the basics here. Again, we're not trying to recruit people to this program directly. That is left to others who know the program and the application process better than we would. But just be sure that they understand the basics of what the Fulbright does. Again, talk about the country and not so much about yourself. Keep it interactive. A lot of folks have gotten a hang, hang of this, of course, during the pandemic, where people learn about how to use polls and how to pose questions. Um, try to keep it interactive so that people uh, are not just listening to a lecture. If needed, um, and you need to secure permission, which varies by age group, you might take photos or screenshots that you have something to share. And of course, the bottom line is enjoy yourself. Uh, when students uh, sense that you're enjoying your presentation rather than droning on, uh, you're gonna have fun and so will they. And finally, step four uh, is follow-up. When you're done with your presentation, you'll wanna thank all of those who made this possible. Consult with the faculty member you've been working with to see if there's any reasonable follow-up. I'm not committing you to doing this over and over again, but perhaps there is some other way you could remain engaged with the students that you met. I mentioned earlier the importance of completing the reflection form on the website. This is so important because if you don't tell us you've done that, we won't know you've done that. So what happened when you were there? Where did you go? Who did you talk to? How many students did you meet with? What did you talk about? And of course, what did you learn to make Fulbright in the classroom better? Again, this is a, a, an ongoing uh, and growing program. We want to learn from you and your experiences. What went right? What went wrong? You'll also have the opportunity to upload your photos. Um, you'll see on our Fulbright in the Classroom website, lots of photos taken by alumni who've participated in the past. You've also seen them in our newsletters and annual reports. Please share your photographs with that. And then finally, inspire some friends uh, who have also experienced the Fulbright to join and, uh, uh, and enjoy this particular program. Let's talk for a few minutes about the grant, and then we'll uh, open it up again to your questions. I see some more have come in and that's terrific. The Fulbright in the Classroom grant program is brand new. We're just rolled this out. We're very pleased uh, to, to report to you the generosity of the Van Otterloo Foundation, which gave us, us a grant in, to fund these, um, these very, uh, this very program. So we're, we're grateful for, to the foundation. As I mentioned before, 23 of you will be given $750 grants to do three presentations at, uh, to classrooms that serve underrepresented communities. As I mentioned before, this might be Title I, K-12 schools, community colleges, and minority-serving institutions. As I said before, you apply by May 1st. You'll learn the outcome by June 1st to do a present, those presentations in the fall. We hope that regardless of the outcome of that decision, that you decide to go ahead and do it anyway. Uh, you've done the work, you've built the relationships. While there, uh, if you don't get a grant, there would, there would be less uh, financial reward, of course. We certainly hope that you'll consider following through. And uh, as I mentioned again, it's a new program. Help us make this better. So your feedback on the grant program is just as important as the wider volunteer program. Some details about applying to the grant. Uh, you will want to create a proposal that, that very clearly tells us where you would go 
Uh, therefore, you will need to contact at least three faculty members at any level to develop this uh, proposal. So where are you going? What are you doing? Who are you doing it with? That will go into a up to 500 word proposal explaining all of that. We'll also want another essay that explains why you want to do this. This would help us to understand the impact of the Fulbright experience on your life and why you want to share it with others. So critical and so important to understand your motivations. And finally, you'll want to solicit two letters of recommendation. Uh, one of them uh, should likely or best be from uh, someone familiar with your Fulbright experience. That might be a, a commission director or someone within a commission. It could be a professor you've worked with. It could be a colleague. Um, if that's not possible, that's okay. We're still looking for recommendations to speak on your behalf. You would submit all of these things. The letters of recommendation would come to us directly. Uh, you would submit all of these things through uh, uh, classroom at fulbright.org. The forms uh, you'll see online will also submit it to us directly. So you'll find the when you go to the grant application website, very simple instructions on how to apply. Okay, before we turn to your questions and uh, back to your questions, I want to thank you for your participation, your interest here. We have uh, almost 60 people on this call, which is so exciting. I'm so grateful to you. In a moment, uh, my colleague Munir will open this up so that you'll see all of you, all of uh, those who are participating. So please stay on board. Um, by participating in Fulbright in the Classroom, you are joining and extending a tremendous and important tradition within the Fulbright community of giving back and sharing and promoting international understanding. So I applaud you for your interest and the hard work that will be ahead, which I greatly appreciate. Help us to build a powerful program. You're going to make it work. You're going to be doing this. And uh, I'm grateful and will learn from you because your stories will inspire others and your feedback will make this program and frankly, the world a lot better. Okay, so I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and I'm gonna have Munir get all of you back on board here. So there we are. While all of that's happening, I'm going to click on the other questions and we'll answer a few more of them. But uh, then we'll do it verbally so you can unmute yourself and uh, please raise your hand if you want to ask a question, but it's great to see all of your faces. Um, let's see, uh, Fernando asked the question, um, uh, are you, what does the $750 grant pay for? So again, this is really a, a financial incentive and a reward for your time. It doesn't necessarily pay for particular um, purchases, say. Um, that's okay. We're interested in creating a little bit of a financial incentive to, to participate. Um, let's see. Here's a question. Uh, I was at a university in Nepal. You seem focused on non-university environments. Uh, if um, I, I didn't mean to uh, suggest that. If you had a university experience overseas, that's great. We want to hear about that experience, and especially in this case about Nepal. Most students don't know anything about Nepal. As far as the audience goes on this side, um, sure, a university audience is appropriate. Um, whatever works for you works, works for us. Uh, Gloria asked this question, uh, and then we'll get to verbal questions. Um, I can definitely assist with finding underrepresented populations that may benefit from these sessions. That's great, Gloria. Please contact me directly at john at fulbright.org, john at fulbright.org or classroom at fulbright.org. Um, does it have to be presented at a school or can it be presented at a local community group? That's a great idea, Gloria, sure. Um, Again, the idea here is not to be so formal as it is to get the message out so that people are learning and benefiting from this. So if, if it would be more appropriate to talk at a community center, go for it. Um, 
let's see, and we'll do one more here um, from Carla. If we are visiting Fulbrighters and we're talking about our home country, do we mention anything about what we did in the United States for our Fulbright? Sure. Again, you want to explain who you are and something about the Fulbright program. If they know anything about Fulbright, they probably think this is a program just for Americans going overseas, when in fact it's an exchange program. International scholars and students come here as well. All right, I'm going to close the uh, questions and ask people to raise their hand if they want to comment. Again, it's it's marvelous to see all your faces. I just this is like a dream come true for me to see all of you. It's, uh, it's so exciting, and I'm so grateful to you. But um, if you have a question or comment, go ahead and raise your hand, and then, and then I'll recognize you, and you can unmute. Okay, there's Kenny. Okay, Kenny Martin. Kenny, if you're, you go ahead and unmute and ask your question or make a comment. Go ahead. Great, thanks. Hi, John. Hi, everyone. Um, for the grant program, and I saw this in the Q&A also, do the three schools need to be different schools? Can they be different grade levels? Could it be the same classroom and giving it, you know, to, or same school to three different classrooms? Or what's your vision of that? Yeah, I, th I think it's okay to give uh, presentations to three different classrooms within the same school if you think you're going to be making a, a greater impact that way or if you've already built up that relationship and you're happy with that that's fine with me um, uh, of course one of the great advantages of a digital situation is that you could reach out to very different schools but i understand that that could be kind of complicated once you're within one school, you might as well keep running with the football. So uh, if that works for you, that works for me. Great. Uh, could I, yeah, could I ask ahead. a quick follow-up? Sure. Um, I've had the idea also of, you know, once, once I pr give a presentation, say to a classroom, connecting that classroom with, I was an ETA in Peru last year, with uh, a classroom in Peru for some sort of pen pal exchange, would that be, you know, uh, a good thing under under the thick program well, that would be fantastic that is the kind of follow-up that we very much have in mind that you're okay. building relationships you're embedding it in their experience if you were able to to create some uh connection between that school and a school in peru that's just that's fantastic i love that idea so please put that in your proposal great thank you you're welcome okay uh carla go ahead you're you're on Yes, thank you. Um, I had a question regarding um, polling students before the presentation, because if I'm going to talk about Spain, maybe it would be helpful if I can, uh, you know, make a survey to have an idea what the students know about Spain so that I'm not repeating too much and I'm actually giving um, new information. Yeah, I, I, I love that idea. Um, that is one of the reasons why having such a good conversation with your faculty partner is important so that they know what you're up to. They, for example, would be able to um, forward that, that link, say, to, a, um, to a, a poll to their students. In other words, there's a, there's a partnership, there's access there. Um, it, pedagogically, that makes a lot of sense. Why, why cover something they already know or uh, target it too low. You know, you're saying all the obvious things. Uh, you're talking about paella or something like that. And they go, that, I mean, for God's sake, everybody knows about paella. Um, but if they don't know anything about that, um, then you're good to go. So yeah, I think that's, uh, that's another good way to get that yeah. conversation going early. Okay. Um, Fernando, go ahead. You've got your hand up. Uh, John, thank you so much for wonderful uh, program that you're introducing and, and all of this. I think this is wonderful to uh, be able to have Fulbright uh, be exposed to students in, in the schools. Uh, one, one recommendation, I don't know if you would agree with this and all that, maybe one of the letters of recommendation could come from a chapter uh, leaders um, that could maybe strengthen as an outcome the relationship between uh, Fulbright members and uh, and chapters, 
and all maybe because I, I thought maybe that would be a, a great way of also informing the local regional uh, leaders of yeah. what what interest there is and all then that could also facilitate things you know for uh, for those that that apply uh, the other thing that I was thinking is that um, I, I know that this program does a great job of being able to expose uh, schools and underrepresented people uh, uh, students to Fulbright, and I'll. Uh, I wonder if maybe in and maybe you mentioned this al already, and and all, and I just overlooked it and all. But maybe emphasizing, uh, maybe as an as another goal of of this program is to just to promote more global um, understanding. Uh, I know that that's beyond giving visibility to Fulbright. Uh, we sometimes you are so insular in in our worlds here in the US and all in promoting understand you know just kind of like travel maybe uh, emphasizing how maybe the students underrepresented groups get can also uh, look forward to having similar types of um, experiences elsewhere yeah so that's that's a that's that maybe a... that's that could be a, a, a another goal that we have is to promote more not only understanding but also like uh, travel so that these underrepresented students feel like they they could also do the same thing later on be it through fulbright or otherwise yeah that's that's a very good point fernando because i think it's important to inspire the concept of a global citizen a global traveler somebody who uh, sees the world with excitement and curiosity rather than fear and suspicion, which is uh, one of the most important missions that you can be on. That's the reason why we don't want this to be explicitly a Fulbright uh, program recruitment effort, right? Because not everybody can win a Fulbright, but everybody can think about the world, can understand it uh, more fully. Uh, there are other resources for travel. There are scholar, other scholarships available. If you're, if you're um, a student receiving a Pell Grant, for example, at a college, you can use that money to study abroad. You can apply for a Gilman. There are lots of ways if you don't have the resources to get overseas. Now, to your first point uh, about chapter leaders, absolutely. We're very interested in connecting this as we have from the beginning with chapter leadership. In fact, later this month, I'll be giving a webinar quite similar to this to our chapter leaders across the country. Um, uh, it's also, remember, you're not applying for a graduate program. I'm not, this is not a job. Uh, think about the two letters that would be most helpful to our committee in helping decide whether this is a good fit for you. Uh, if that's a chapter leader, that's a chapter leader. All good. Um, so thank you, Fernando. Uh, Linda, let me go to to you. What uh, what's your question or comment? Yes, when you just mentioned uh, the concept of the global citizen, it just tweaked in my mind. Perhaps added to the classrooms on campuses, we might think about a presentation for the foreign language faculty of a given institution, say a college or a university, uh, because they're the ones on the front lines. I don't wanna use that term that's sort of been beaten to the ground about it, but they're the ones who then would encourage their students to take on this lens of a global citizen. So it's just something that was sparked uh, no, it's, said, it's, John, it's so. a great it's a great idea, Linda, because what we're trying to do is both build relationships with with students and faculty, but also mm -hmm. with institutions. So we have institutional members, we have institutional partners. Uh, we very much want to grow our partnership with the HBCU and community college communities, for example. Um, they'll get to know us better and who we are, thanks to your outreach. Right. And we can follow up with that. We can we have some place to go with that, so they see tangibly how Fulbrighters can contribute to their mission. Uh, let let me go to Khalid, Khalid, and then Gloria. Khalid, go ahead. Can you speak a little louder? I can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Just barely, but go ahead. So I just want to sort of run things based on my experience. 
but I just walked back to Pula from Jordan um, back at the university. I had the chance to talk to middle school students uh, in Indiana, and that was, was really a rewarding experience for myself. So, uh, yeah, one thing that I thought was very useful for this program is to um, talk to like normal friends. Did you try to fix maybe, maybe something with the map? Is it Kelly, any better Kelly, now? Kelly, that's better. Yeah. Go ahead. Oh, now sorry, we can hear you clearly. Yeah, sorry Great. about that. Fantastic. Too many mics. Um, yeah, thank you so much for the program. And I wanted to share something from my own experience. So as a Fulbright scholar from Jordan at Purdue, um, I had the chance to talk to uh, middle school students in Indiana. And that was really rewarding. So yeah, again, thank you for this great program. One thing that I thought was really useful from my experience is to actually try to reach out to teachers early in the academic year and that um, you know make it um, possible for them to figure out how to incorporate your talk within their lesson plan um, so for example in indiana they had you know sometimes like a middle east festival as part of i think the history um, class and um, you know it was easy for for them to fit us in within that program so if you try to you know reach out to them early in the academic year it, it becomes much more um, attractive for teachers um, to incorporate the talk within their plan yeah uh, thanks great, again. You're welcome. A great, a great point, Khalid. Um, it this is one of the reasons why the volunteer piece of this program, not the grant program, but the volunteer piece, where you can go and do this at any time, is very, very flexible. So, uh, in in effect, there's no there's no time constraints to this. So, if you wanted to wait on this idea and in late August or early September reach out to teachers at a local school and say, hey, sometime in the coming quarter or semester, what do you think about doing this? They go, this is great. Um, so there's a lot of flexibility here. I think that's been, I hope that's been a theme of this conversation. I want this to suit your abilities and connect to their needs. And that's hard to, that's hard to predict. So best to give you uh, flexibility and Fulbrighters are all great at this. You guys know how to do this. You don't need me coaching you every step of the way. Gloria, um, go ahead and ask your question. Okay, this is sort of a comment and a question is embedded in the comment, I guess. Of course. But one of the things is that we live in such a wonderful global virtual world now until what I have found it very easy to do, and I just want to throw this out there, is that it's very easy also for me to bring into my presentations, the people who are actually in country. Uh, for instance, I did my full writer in Malta and it's been wonderful. I learned that we have more people here that are from Malta than I ever knew, number one, but that we were actually able to talk to the people in Malta uh, in real time. You know, we had to sort of work around their time and get some agreements set into place there. But I, we hadn't talked about that, but we virtually have that capacity now, which is sort of wonderful, I think too, as a way of extending that. Gloria, yeah, yeah. I, I, I love that idea, too. Uh, in, in fact, there are no ideas on this call that we that are that haven't been fantastic. This one is especially good because you're right. You can pull people in digitally in ways that no one ever imagined. I mean, obviously, the connection to Malta or to any distant country, you couldn't possibly afford to fly somebody in uh, and bring them to a classroom that, that that's that may be completely impossible, but this can work. So if you're willing to make that connection, willing to coordinate that and make that happen, I think the impact of that would be tremendous, really tremendous. Um, Nadira, you got, um, um, you got your hand raised. I hope I pronounced the name right. Yeah, you did <laughs> perfectly. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much for um, hosting this great um, webinar. Sure. So I have a, I just want to make sure that I understand. Um, it's not that we need to like specifically provide outreach to schools, right? We can develop our own strategy of who we want to, which groups we want to target, and then just explain why. Is that what I heard? That's right. That's right. Um, you have the flexibility to figure out, um, given your contacts, your resources, the time that you can you can devote to this who do you want to reach out to so for instance it could be associations or like you know like 
topic specific like women's groups or different groups um as long as we identify i guess that's my question like we have the leverage do we have the leverage to identify which groups that we are targeting and just explain why why we are targeting those groups I, like and i guess in making our sure. argument sure well of course the title of the program suggests that our principal venue for sharing is a classroom whether it's digital or otherwise and we're looking to partner primarily with educational institutions now that said there are obviously lots of nonprofits associations and others for whom a partnership might might be completely appropriate. I don't want to I don't want to put a cap on that. I would say for the purposes of the grant um, that some something that that would look a little bit more like a, an educational institution might be a better fit. But if you've got an idea and you want to share it with me specifically rather than in principle, go ahead and send me an email either through classroom at fulbright.org or john at fulbright.org and we can talk about it. I love the spirit of what you're talking about. I just need to see a few more specifics. Okay, thank you so much. So it's john at fulbright.org? That's it, it's as simple okay, as thank that. thank you so much. Yeah, you're welcome, Nadir. I look forward to, to hearing from you. All right, let's go with Grace and then Fernando. Go ahead, Grace. And then Martha, I see your hand up. We'll get to you in a minute. Go ahead, Grace. Thank you, John. Um, great presentation, and I'm glad you're putting this scholarship. Just a quick question. I did my Fulbright in Tajikistan, and if I want to present to a high school or college in Tajikistan, because Fulbright is a both ways, right? Would that qualify for this grant? That's not what we have in mind for this grant. Um, I, I love the idea, but this grant is really designed to serve American audiences. Um, so in this case, uh, teaching students about Tajikistan, I mean, the, the chance of you running into a student anywhere in the United States who knows even where Tajikistan is, is about zero, right? Um, so imagine the impact of your uh, outreach to, to an American classroom. Now that said, of course, outside of this grant, you know, that's a fabulous idea. I would never discourage that. But I think for the purposes of this grant, we're looking at, at a domestic audience. Thank you. Sure. Okay, Fernando and then Martha. And we've got about five minutes left. So go ahead, Fernando. Fernando, you're muted and we can't see you. There we go. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I think I, I, I didn't know how to bring down my hand. Oh, okay. So we'll go. Sorry that's okay. That. That's right. You've asked the question already. Martha, go ahead. I just want to check on this. <clears throat> uh, when we want to do something and we want to call it Fulbright in the classroom, do we have to go through this process? I mean, on the one hand, all of us have a lot of initiative. We do it. Does it need to have your approval? In other words, as long as we're going to use your name, even if we don't need the money, um, do we need to at least report in and have somebody oversee it? And then the question is, do we need that that huge long thing with the recommendations and everything? If we're no, excellent question. So let me be clear. Uh, what I spoke of, of two options, right? You could volunteer and not do the grant thing at all, or you could do the grant. Now, of course, you could do both, but let, let's make that distinction quite clear. So in the, in the first case, you could go anywhere at any time, take the name of this program. I'm going to trust you as a Fulbrighter <laughs> to honor the tradition and, and, and the messaging. You guys, I trust, because, I mean, you know, of course I trust you. Um, I, I don't need oversight over this. That's silly and wasteful and time consuming, but I do want to hear from you when it's over okay. um, so that we know what impact you've had. We can share that with others. If you guys all do this and then forget to tell me you've done this, well, where, where do we go? Um, we, we can't celebrate. We can't learn. We can't inspire. So, on the far end, I'd really love to hear from you. If you need help in the middle, and you probably don't, uh, let me know. But so the, the grant is another matter. Then that's a competition. 
and we're accountable to the foundation and and so on but you've got full freedom before that go ahead about that template that reflection template is that a good place to go to report in i mean are there is or can we just you know do our usual thing I would rather you not do your usual thing. Yes, please. <laughs> uh, yes, much as I love all of you, uh, please go to that. <laughs> go to that form so that we have a way of organizing it and a place right, for, for it right. to for it to go. If you yeah, all okay. sent me sort of random reports to my email, God help me, um, that would be a big mess. So yes, the reflection form would be <laughs> would be best. Um, let's see. Any final question we're down to a minute or two um yes i have a question yes please go ahead when when you use the term faculty like a faculty um wait a minute i can't i can't see who's speaking right now let's see it's it's paula okay paula go ahead yes when you mention um support from a faculty it could that be interchangeable with the teacher or a principal at the at the um elementary school or wherever we are seeking to i mean that's what the faculty is a teacher principal, yeah that's exactly entity. right i'm uh yes i'm using that term interchangeably so a faculty member could be an elementary school teacher or it could be a community college professor anybody who is an instructor who is running the classroom him or herself that's what i'm talking about so um, again working directly with instructors with teachers with professors with faculty that's what we're talking about so yes thank you paula that's an excellent question um, thank you you're most welcome all right i'm gonna i'm gonna shut this down this has been a fabulous conversation i've had a lot of fun i hope you've learned um, as as much as you need to get out there and start sharing your experiences. Um, if you need any further help or contact, please let us know. All of those resources are online. If there are more that you need, let us know. If you're happy with them, also let us know. Um, I, uh, I look forward to uh, getting those, those great reports. Martha, get me the report, not some other thing. Um, and uh, we look forward to your, your progress. Thank you all very much for your time and energy and all that you're going to do moving forward. Have a great day.